So allow me to introduce uh, Godfrey Sakwa Masai, who is going to make his presentation linking corporate social responsibility, increasingly now being known as corporate social investment and community development. Of course, uh, Godfrey, you might want to say more about yourself than as you take the floor. When he is done, then uh, we'll um, have a session of interaction. Welcome. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Daniel, and uh, I'm glad to be here today with you. I hope I'm audible enough. So as I've uh, been mentioned, my name is uh, Godfrey Sakomasai. I'm a development practitioner focusing majorly in corporate engagement uh, on the private sector. At, but by studies, I'm a practitioner in community development. Uh, this is, um, I've been working in this particular area for almost 10 years now, uh, across different sectors from education, health, and even in conservation. So I look forward to interacting with you today and sharing more about my experience and also the learnings around uh, how can we link community development uh, with the uh, corporate social engagement, what we are calling CSR or CSI. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, we can now proceed with the presentation and I'll make it very brief, but also try to captivate your attention. And I look forward to your questions and comments at the end of the session. Thank you very much. Uh, next slide, please. So we want to look at this um, big animal that we normally refer to it as a community development or a, basically the aspect of community development. So in the next slide, as uh, we proceed in the sharing is that um, we understand community development to be uh, focusing more around alleviation of suffering uh, taken by civil society, religious institution, as well as government. And it's mostly targeting towards addressing a particular issue within a community be it an issue around health, be it an issue around education. But basically, we look at community development as uh, being a practice carried out by these practitioners with the help of uh, the community and other actors to ensure this uh, direction takes a particular way in addressing issues in the community. However, we came to understand um, CSR or the corporate social responsibility came within the 70s or the 1970s, whereby it took root within the business community as a way of forming a social contract between the business and the community. Why did it happen like that? Uh, you find that when business began operating, there was a, an issue about ethics. How are they making profits within the community or where are they operating, but not addressing those issues? It could be an issue of social issues. It could be around the environment. It could be around even the jobs that they were giving. But most importantly, this term was coined in the 1970s whereby people began, began taking an, a keen interest into how can we then bring in the aspect of community and business being on the same level. Next. Yep. So to, for us to understand CSR better, we look at how it was initially founded. And this was by an economist known as Howard Boyle in the 1953. So the idea was basically to try and organize society by making companies to become more responsible. As I said earlier, Companies used to invest in an area, but never really understood how do we plug in or come back to support the communities that we are working in or the society. So there's an aspect of understanding the social well-being of a society, as well as um, helping the companies to give back from a point of social good, uh, mostly through philanthropic causes uh, that were driving the societal change. But also it is important to note that uh, CSR emerged mostly in the manufacturing sector or in the areas that were heavily uh, pollutants or causing the most harm to the environment. Because as we know, the environment has become a key issue of conversation, even in the times that we're living in from climate change to the weather patterns that you're noticing currently. So CSR majorly came out as a result of uh, trying to counter or resolve issues around environmental challenges that we or uh, the business community tried to solve at that particular time. And next. Okay, so as we look into the business uh, aspect of corporate social responsibility, before we go back to community development, we, there are key things that come up in our minds. There are issues such as the market, issues around ethics, uh, sincerity about the intention of uh, these interventions that we are bringing, the issue of resources. Um, when you talk about, for example, cutting trees, uh, about labor, 
all these are resources that are coming from the community or the society. How are we exploiting them as a business? And then what is the initial call of a business, for example, or the goal? Because at the end of the day, a business is more focused around profit making, which is one which, which we call the single bottom line. However, at the end of the presentation, we shall be able to see how can we then look at the other ways uh, a business can be able to meet its goal without making losses. And then of course, there is the aspect of the long-term engagement. There's now the issue of responsibility, and then most importantly, sustainability. That is what incorporates the big, uh, the big language or all the big terms around CSR or the corporate social responsibility. But looking further from um, another point of um, the European Business Journal or the uh, around management, we understand that CSR began to gain momentum for out of the seven reasons that are listed here. One of them is uh, about building pressure against the businesses. So as we mentioned earlier, people began to ask, what are we getting from the business about the services, about uh, the services that they're giving and the products? Is it that the only uh, end game of a business or can it do more? And then people became more aware about the role of the society and the stakeholders. Because again, companies became to understand that society is watching us. Are we becoming a more responsible company? Are we understanding the needs of the society that we are working in? Or are we just getting resources and then leaving? And then thirdly was an issue around responsibility by the businesses. Because again, as we said, apart from just employing people, giving them jobs, exploiting the natural resources that were available, what are they doing, for example, in terms of water stewardship? What are they doing, for example, in terms of aspects such as the environmental conservation, looking at their level of pollution, among, among many other factors? And then the other thing that also came to develop with this particular term CSR was around the issue of policies and identification of the best practices. Because again, not all intentions were well crafted or well thought out initially. I'll give an example of the way most uh, companies, for example, will do these Christmas or um, festivities kind of contributions. Do they really become impactful in a society if we question them or is it a one-off? And then apart from just developing the policies, it also came to a point to understand how do we then implement them for the benefit of the community as well as the company or the business at that particular point. And then of course, developing of several programs to implement because as I said, community development focuses are around aspects of uh, around health, education, maternal care, among other things. Companies also had to align themselves. E.g., if you're working in the, in the manufacturing industry, what are you likely to cause as a harm in the society? And how can we counter that as we focus or try to develop our CSR like policies as, a, as an organization? And then of course, other things around performance and compliance evaluation. Of course, in any other activity that we undertake as a business or a company, we have to look at how it's performing. And then there's the issue of compliance. Of course, we work within the parameters because no company can just go and set up its own rules and then start implementing them without having parameters to get the outcome and the long-term effect of that. So these uh, seven areas were what is also guiding or came out as the, the main reasons why the term CSR and the movement around CSR began to gain momentum as a form of community development. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Yes. So in this particular slide, we just want to understand how did uh, CSR end up becoming a tool of community development or how did that end up uh, growing into that particular direction of community development? So initially we saw uh, the CSR movement began as a tool of, I would say, companies becoming uh, more corporate citizens, understanding their role in terms of what they're doing in society to build credibility as well as share value and even employee retention amongst other things. But again, what became to what came to now stand out was the idea or the transition whereby companies moved from just addressing the damages that they were causing to the journey of transformation of societies and their communities. In that, they're not only focusing at looking at the short-term gain, but they were looking at more how could they win the hearts and the and the minds of the communities that they were working in. So it's just it moved from just a, being a problem solver to a daily an opportunity creator, if you look at it from that particular perspective. And then uh, secondly, it transformed from just a practice that will eventually uh, enhance corporate uh, responsibility or citizenship. It also uh, helped companies to grow their shareholder value 
and also promote sustainability within organizations in that you'll find people who want to go to companies that are more inclined or have a human face. So you'll find their shareholder in the market tended to improve. Thus, people will pump more money and even commit more resources towards community development aspects of their uh, CSR. And also as well as their sustainability in that companies were able to develop solutions that looked into the human being aspect of the future. Thus, uh, guaranteeing them some sense of sustainability in that they develop a bit of ownership within the areas they are operating, whether it's at a regional or a country level. And then uh, CSR also gave the opportunity for companies to have a competitive advantage. Um, I don't want to mention any particular companies, but um, especially, for example, if you're in Kenya, you'll be able to see um, some of the big companies are able to compete amongst their industry out of how people perceive them. If they perceive them to be more responsible and caring for them, people will tend to incline themselves towards such a particular company. So you see, at the end of the day, it was not just business as usual. It ended up being a tool for community development, but at the same time, companies were able to gain mileage from uh, just being mere uh, tools of production into actually game changers in terms of transformation. And then um, the aspect of uh, also transformation across sectors, because initially companies came and focused more on philanthropic causes in that they will just dedicate money into one particular organization or a group or a community. But with time, we've seen a transition whereby companies develop strong CSR arms that are able to, to cascade their work into particular areas such as health, education, environment, youth, and even women empowerment. And it just gives you an impression of how uh, CSR and community development are also becoming responsive to the needs of the community and uh, the society at this particular point. And uh, that also shows you how CSR has been able to grow over time. And then also from another point of business, CSR also offered companies a soft landing to expand awareness of their products and services. Because as much as they carried their CSR as a tool for community development, they were able to also set up a shop and even just expand their footprint within geographical markets that they are operating in. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so we just want to see how is the correlation or what is the connection between community development and CSR. We've seen one comes from a point of the development world in terms of addressing uh, societal challenges and issues. The other one comes from a point of business, uh, creating uh, market visibility, but as well as just controlling the damage, as well as bringing change within the societies that they are serving. So one of the key um, areas of uh, a unifying area is on the uh, idea to solve society problems. Because one of the key things, even if, even if you look at um, entrepreneurship, for example, the most advanced levels of entrepreneurship and even uh, business, for example, with the companies like um, Google, you go, for example, to uh, any software companies or even companies working around sanitation, whether it's health, whether it's about water. The key thing is about solving a problem. And that's where we draw a very close similarity between community development and CSR, in that both of them look at addressing either a gap in the society or addressing an issue that uh, basically affects, affects a community. And then the second aspect where they have a similarity is also in the issue of um, aligning to, which is just uh, an extension of the first point, is either they are aligning to either elevating suffering, improving livelihoods, or bringing better solutions to better communities. Whether it's connectivity, whether it's an issue of health, you see that's a very close area in terms of uh, CSR and community development uh, correlation. And then uh, CSR has a business angle that um, to develop companies focus on ROI, which is basically the return on investment. The, the other angle that you look also at it is that um, as much as community development seems to be perceived to come from the non-profit or the not-for-profit not area or the school of thought, both are now shifting towards focusing on the issue of um, the return on investment. How much in terms of not only the money, but the value they're able to draw, whether it's at a community level, whether it's in terms of the value that they're pumping and even the skills. And that's why you find, for example, as we speak at this particular time, sustainability has become a key issue in any other particular project. And that's a common front that community development and CSR are both focusing on. And then the last area is um, 
is an area around improvement on learning uh, in that all uh, both sides of the school of thought, that is the community development and uh, the corporate social uh, responsibility side, they are focusing more around now monitoring and evaluation, impact and sustainability measurement in that the alignment between the two has helped this particular area to improve. Basically, you see that um, uh, the two schools of thought are able to combine the knowledge, the skill and capacity to measure in to measure the kind of uh, projects that are being undertaken, whether they are really addressing the problems or they are just uh, mere, mere marketing tools, or it's just a tool to promote a particular agenda as opposed to addressing challenges that communities are facing. And next. So we want to just, uh, as we, we are about to wind up, uh, as we progress towards now, what is popularly being referred to as a CSI or the corporate social uh, investment, which is an advanced level of uh, CSR in that um, there has been a very great shift. Even if you look at the way companies name those particular dockets uh, from CSR to, uh, to corporate social investment, in terms of uh, in responsibility, in terms of uh, kindness, it's shifting from just being an act of showing that a company is responsible, but it's becoming a tool of interventions by companies. Also, it, uh, that's affecting community development in terms of impact and quality, in that companies are shifting more towards quality, towards more value, towards more depth, as opposed to just doing mere paperwork or just uh, dishing out those particular monies, depending on which economies you're working in. It might be an issue of um, saving on the tax. It can be an issue of building on reputation. It can be an issue of just mere practice to meet the standards of a particular market. However, it's now becoming a strong arm of organizations in that, uh, for example, you'll find CSR used to sit in the marketing and public and relations offices in uh, most organizations. But now you will notice that companies are either forming foundations, uh, which are very huge and are well endowed in terms of resources and skills. They are hiring professionals. They are putting clear metrics and reporting systems that go in hand in hand in community development. They're actually hiring professionals from the side of community development to be able to help them craft the best solutions that have uh, their best intentions and also blend well with the community in terms of uh, community development, mobilization, and also becoming a more professionalized um, kind of engagement. So on the my right, you can also be able to notice one of the biggest shifts from just CSR to CSI is more around reliability. They are putting more reliable systems. They are focusing more on integrity. That's why you will see, and I remember one of our participants today he talked about working with organizations and also helping them to reach and access resources. Because one of the big issue that when it comes to working with corporates is um, understanding the measures of integrity, transparency, and reliability in that people want to see the value for their money. People want to understand where the resources went to and how they are going to gain from it, not merely just as a peer exercise, but also in terms of real impact. And then there's an issue of establishing real commitment, developing core values that really work well with the community, organizations, whether it's a CPO, an NGO, and the corporates. And then lastly, building stronger connections, trust, and are really replicating and addressing the core value around social responsibility. So that's what really encompasses the big transition from just CSR as a mere practice into an investment. Communities are now looking at it as an investment, not just for the sake of the money that is going into that particular field, but more around the impact and sustainability of that particular investment. And next. Okay, so as we are about to wind up, um, uh, just one more slide, Henley. Uh, uh, thank you. So we want to look at um, some of the core areas around, uh, as I mentioned, there is a single bottom line and the triple bottom line and how it relates to CSR and community development. Because both look at people as the core of this particular uh, operation or this kind of engagement. So what used to be the core areas of a business was mostly around profit making in that we used to look at a company from the amount of money a company used to make at the end of the day. 
but more companies are being challenged. The system, there's been a system change globally whereby we are now looking at the triple bottom line, uh, whereby we don't look at business in terms of just the profit. We've added two more pillars, which we now refer to as the triple bottom line. One is on people around the social impact, and then the other one is on the planet, uh, which is mostly on the environment. So for any project or any intervention to qualify as a very strong CSR, CSI component that has community development in it, it has to focus, yes, on the people in that it brings in equity and it's also acceptable within the communities. And then there's also the aspect of the planet. How are we using our resources? Is it in a renewable and sustainable manner? Or are we just explain, exploiting them for the purposes of just making profit and then leaving them? And then of course, eventually for businesses, profit is very key. And uh, of course, I normally like to make fun of it and say, as much as companies also want to um, really incorporate development and uh, community development within the areas they work and the wider region, they need profits and they need money to pump into these particular uh, projects or solutions that we ask them to uh, uh, invest in. Uh, next, and I think that is the last side, slide. Yeah, so what is the conclusion? Uh, one is um, uh, CSR can help companies undertake meaningful community development interventions. As we said ed earlier, education, healthcare, uh, skills that are upskilling up for the youth, uh, water accessibility, agriculture, are some of the human challenges that are facing us, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, depending on uh, the regions that we come from differently, the different challenges really bring up uh, different uh, sets of solutions and, and uh, aspects of interventions. Therefore, CSR offers companies an opportunity to really undertake community development and help um, bring in the right solutions and technical technology that is able to really address these particular issues. And then secondly is that uh, CSR uh, can also help accelerate community development. One of the things that we know is apart from mobilizing communities, uh, we have the church, we have the government efforts that are being put together to address issues. But the biggest resource that normally sometimes proves to be a challenge is when it comes to money. Not only money, but the capabilities, uh, the finances, as we've mentioned before, and even the skills. So through CSR, we see companies are able to offer one, a wider geographical reach. I remember, for example, in Kenya, there are places where uh, we have companies who are able to extend their reach even beyond where we might not find very strong uh, government offices or even uh, religious or, or, or um, any, any form of community development that is very strong at that particular point. But since a company offers a solution or a service in that area, you find a company has the capacity to extend the machinery all the way there. And then of course, there's the financial capacity and of course the skills and capabilities because companies are able to pay highly skilled individuals who in turn are able to offer their services as they are, uh, uh, they are undertaking community development interventions. So uh, lastly is just to, to emphasize on the importance of harnessing both aspects of our community development to, co pro to not only solve problems, but also to help companies promote their image. However, I want to caution and just um, uh, really just emphasize on one thing that normally sometimes it has to be checked on and that is on the issue of the outcome and management of expectations because of course, when we see a company, we see a lot of money, but of course, when companies uh, uh, come to bring a solution or rather take a community development project, they also have to look at the end game of it all. So it's also very important as we are practitioners uh, venture into corporate engagement, or maybe you want to go into the private sector and work with them through their CSR arms. You also have to look at how, how you have to manage your expectations. They're not there to take all your burdens at once, but also have, have, they also have to be keen to ensure you're able to document properly how you're able to measure your impact and how you're able to make your projects more sustainable. And lastly, it's just also to safeguard on issues around greenwashing and whitewashing. Uh, for those who are familiar, uh, this is whereby companies might purport to be addressing a problem, but this is basically just sugarcoating an issue whereby they're not really focusing on the problem, it's more of a PR stand. In that, for example, we shall say, we discharge a lot of waste into the rivers, uh, knowing that we manufacture a particular product. We discharge a lot of waste into the river, and then we give out a few coins or a few shillings to a local CBO uh, that is downstream to just pick papers on the way. You see, that is not really a solution. That is just basically 
sugar coating a problem where at the end of the day you're not really addressing an, uh, the real core issue around that. So with that, I just want to say that um, CSR has a very strong linkage to community development. And I believe if well harnessed, then this is an area that we can use to harness the capacity and impact of community development solutions that we have, as well as work with the private sector as they, are, they form a key employer, as we know that from an economic perspective, but also a well positioned to help address current challenges and future that we face as uh, societies. So with that, I wish to end my presentation and open the floor for either comments or questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Geoff Godfrey, for a wonderful presentation. And again, I like where you are ending whitewash, whitewashing and the greenwashing. Often we have been talking about the whitewashing so much, but now greenwashing is coming on board, which again, as you talk about the issues of environmental sustainability, then equality also becomes important because you can pretend to appear to be green when really we are not green and therefore we are not very responsible citizens when it comes to ensuring environmental and social safeguards as we work with corporations. So let's appreciate uh, Godfrey for the wonderful presentation. And then of course, uh, again, we, we are also coming to a point where you, you've made it very clear that at the core of community development is uh, the people and equally at the core of uh, corporate social responsibility, moving to corporate social investment is also the people. And where again, corporates are moving from now short term uh, stance through public relations uh, to long term investment in the people so that ultimately they can also be assured of value is the interact with, with communities. And then they also become now long-term citizens and having that long-term perspective then becomes very useful. And for us in community development, then this means then as we mobilize and build partnerships, then we build partnerships and also enlighten communities that also the corporates within their reach, equally they're also partners who also need to be brought on board when it comes to participation. And of course, then they also become a source of resources to augment whatever else is available from the government systems and from the other agencies who might have resources to support community development. Thank you very much, Godfrey. And the floor is open for comments. You can unmute yourself and go. But Samuel has a hand up. Is it a hand or is it a clap? Okay, I will leave it open. For comment, observations. May I may I come in here? Uh, sure, do it. Sakwa, I I I appreciate the uh, the uh, presentation, but I think we will all have to accept and I think you do it in your presentation, that, that business, uh, corporate business and community development will always be, uh, will always be uh, un, we'll put, it, put it uneasy and uneasy partnership, but needed. Uh, the one cannot do really without the other but there will always be a level of uneasiness. You know, I've seen so many all over the globe uh, partnership projects in South Africa specifically, uh, we are in a very awkward stage of, of partnership projects, which ended up in the fraud and the whole country is in a mess because of that. They all claimed community development as will be the result and was money laundering and everything that goes into that. When we bring in the green people, you get the very same thing. Uh, and and, and I'm, 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 I'm very much aware of the uneasiness of the mix, but the necessity of the mix. What I find difficult in community development perspective as a closure is when corporate business talk about community development, it's seldom very specific unless they have a project 
I mean, who is the community? Is it the workers? Is it the transnational uh, consumers? Is it, uh, you know, it becomes uh, something you cannot really always dictate, handle, uh, uh, yeah, put into a nice uh, wrap it up and say, this is my community. So my comment to you is, who do the general corporate business see as their community in their activities? Thank you very much, okay. David. You can take that uh, one and then you can I think I'll take the, the second one, then I'll answer both of them. Thank you for the comments too. Okay, G G Jim Robertson. Thanks very much, uh, Sakma, for your your presentation. And apologize if my sound disappears. It's been a bit uh, uh, hazy this morning. Apologize for that. It's interesting your your whole uh, kind of thesis in terms of corporate social responsibility. But one of the things you might like to have a look at and consider is what it's called in the UK and internationally community wealth building. Mm -hmm. Community wealth building. And that touches the things that the vet comes because right from the beginning, as I read it, the, the principles which underpin community wealth building are very, very comfortable with community development principles at core. So for example, uh, plural ownership of the economy and a very very central principle you know for community wealth building making financial power work for local places very very kind of key uh, fair employment and just labor markets you know in terms of minimum wage in terms of all these ideas that come from that progressive procurement of goods and services and socially productive use of land and property. And community development, uh, from my experience, is challenged by, 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 by these principles, which I think are very close to community development. And I think this is sharpened for me by uh, a colleague that I work with who's committed to community development. And he is actually a, a tenant farmer in the northeast of England. And he, he told me the other day that the landowner on his part uh, rents out 70 farmers, farms. I just couldn't believe it. So in some sense, it had been seven, seven farms. I thought that was a lot, but 70. So raising the question in terms of land ownership, you know, uh, which community development has got to challenge. and. You recognize I'm a Scot by origin, uh, where Mayor is, is based there. And actually, Scotland is actually owned by people who don't live in Scotland. Land ownership. So, something like 2% is owned by people who live in that country. So, so see what we're trying to say here that. There's nothing wrong in the corporate social responsibility. It's, it sits comfortably with uh, research into social capital and all these, these kind of things. But profoundly, you know, as I see community development changes to community economic development. And I think internationally, we've been quite weak on that, to be honest. Uh, so it's not peculiar to your paper, but I think it's, it's, it's the case generally speaking. So anyway, it's just a, a feedback, very interesting presentation, very helpful. And uh, I gained a lot from it, but just uh, a comment about these five key principles. Uh, mm -hmm. But if you, if you want to look it up, Community Wealth Burnley, the organization is CLES, C L E S, CLES, which means Community Local Economic Strategies. And they use these five principles. Uh, and it's quite well documented for interest. Oh, thank thank you. you. 
Yeah. Uh, thank you, Jim. It might be also helpful if you can put it in the chat so that people can pick it. Yes, I'll do that. Just the, yeah, that, that would be very helpful. And th th thanks for the for the comment. Now that again, you are talking about community wealth building, which ultimately is what uh, should be the end game for community development processes. But uh, yeah. Sako, you might want now to comment. Yeah, sure. I'll, I really like the comments from Jim and Dewet because um, they have really touched on very key issues. One, uh, if I may start with the last one from Jim is uh, on what is really the community development uh, angle that we are taking. And from a, a, from a practitioner level, I would say Kenya is really uh, where we sit. We are really um, uh, behind, we are catching up. I would say that because it's becoming a key area where communities are becoming concerned it's an issue where you just speak and live. What are we gaining as a community? And that has really opened up a room of conversations. So uh, for example, two years ago when I was working in the oil and gas sector, one of the key areas that I saw as an area, not only just undertaking community and developing from a point of uh, doing a project, they were actually the fencing opportunities for women and youth, whereby they could actually undertake procurement uh, from a particular company to either supply a particular kind of goods so there are actually like six companies. I remember working on an IFC uh, pro pro project here in Kenya that is actually working currently, where they were able to bring fence opportunities that looked not only from a point of bringing in uh, community development from what we really know as uh, the usual community development practice, but more focusing towards li livelihoods, uh, focusing more towards um, issues of the markets because there, there is, for example, at some point, women were not able to uh, get some bit of uh, procurement services because of issues of gender, um, uh, gender gender inequality, if I may use that word. So that is an area that I would say it's a really in, um, interesting field and I'll actually look into it because um, that's a new area because we also in the pace of learning as a country, as a region, because as I said earlier, we are moving from just a point of undertaking a, an intervention, but what value are we able to get out of it? <coughs> and then on the second question on the issue of community, different companies define their community differently. So mostly they look at the size of the company. Um, a company that has a national presence will work towards trying to take a project that really covers a regional or a national outlook. Then for companies that are more global, um, they will take a, region, a, a, a national or a regional perspective, sorry, international in that looking at their stronger markets, how do they want to advance their business agenda? Because one thing I said initially, if I am a business, I look inwardly. I usually call it the we in FM, what's in it for me? So for example, if I discover my impact is greatest in the East African region, I will take one hub and really experiment with that particular product and then move in the South Africa and maybe West Africa, and then eventually be able to expand the interventions that we are taking. So it depends also with the leadership, a different board member, a different CEO will come and say, for example, our focus is a marathon then a few years down the line, someone changes. So it also guides, also depending on how companies have really founded the environmental safeguarding practic practicals or uh, practices in that, are they cast on stone or are they based on an individual changing them each and every time? So each and every company is able to define their community differently. And of course, you mentioned something around, is it the employee or is it the community? Yes, these two actually also come into what we now call employee engagement. Some companies will just go as, we not only invest in the community, but they will go a step and involve their employees in that particular intervention. In that if, for example, we work with women, they will dedicate a particular uh, segment within their staff to be actually volunteering their time or their skill in that particular aspect. So that actually expands their community and defines them from just being their employees all the way to the community and just gives them a wider spectrum and more ownership. I know time is almost up, Dr. Tari, but as I wind up is that um, to safeguard the interests of the NGOs and the CSOs, one thing that they have to do is to put in place very strong safeguards. For example, we might want to work with uh, high net worth individuals. And uh, sorry, I don't want to put any country in, um, in, in, um, in this respect, but I'll say, for example, in Africa, where most of us come from, the biggest issue is what is the source of my wealth as an individual? Yes, I am a billionaire in Africa. Where did my money come from? Is it uh, generational wealth? Did I, did, did I innovate a new idea? Did I come up with a great invention? Nothing. It's mostly corruption. It's mostly issues of dictatorship. So you find even if you are a small NGO, 
you really fear you don't want to touch what we call dirty money. Of course, we can't define clean and dirty money. That's also another a big area to discuss in another day. But I, you want to work with the private sector, but you find how can I work with the high net worth individuals? I can't determine the level of integrity that their money came in. So one of the best ways to save that the organization is also just putting in place very strong ethical measures, issues around integrity, and issues of just being able to understand how do we work and what's in it for it? What is our best interest? Are we being used, for example? Are you gaining, for example, what you are calling the service fee? Because I might give you 1 million, for example, to provide to street children, but what are you going to pay your staff? What are you going to manage the organization with? So at the end of the day, as a practitioner, you have to look inwardly and say, yes, we are pushing your agenda. We are pushing community development, but where do we collaborate? Because I think that is where people used to fear to work with NGO, with the private sector. They used to say that since they're giving me money, let me be very humble and just take it. But at the end of the day, you can't account for it. You can't use it properly because you didn't have the right measures. So I wish to stop there, but this has been really interesting. Uh, thank you so much. Muted, Daniel. You're muted. Yeah, th thank you, Sako. We have um, maybe another two, um, another six or so minutes, then uh, we can wind up. Possibly, if you have other any any other comments, John, you have uh, brought in the issue of ethical consumers and how we also need to be aware of the issue of tokenism. Maybe you might want to make a comment, John Conwell. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Daniel. Yeah, I, th I think it's been said really, but um, you know, it, I think the majority of CSR practice, as was clear from the presentation, is is more about marketing and you know, improving the image of the company and and just doing something small um, that is not really deep and meaningful and not really contributing to community development. That, of course, there are lots of exceptions, but. Uh, you know, I, I really agree with the points about, um, you know, encouraging companies to actually pay people properly, give them good working conditions. You know, that that would be a real CSR, I think, you know, and, and something to to boast about rather than just to improve the advertising. I, I just finished reading a book about Coca-Cola, and I'm sure some of you are aware of the horrendous things Coca-Cola have done over the years. And, and really, you know, and yet they're very good on... But they appear to be very good on CSR. But I think if you read something like that, you'd you'd never go near Coca-Cola ever again, <laughs> you know. But what do we get? One billion reasons in Africa to 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 drink Coca-Cola and to support Coca-Cola and all the rest. Anyway, so that's my my discussion, my my comment. Not a comment. The proceedings are being recorded, so we'll be able to follow on uh, from my. Sorry, yeah, you'll be able to follow from our from my SED website once the, the the recording is processed. So, thank you very much for joining us, and I I appreciate also quite a number of your colleagues also from from Nigeria who are on board with us. Thank you very much. Yeah, we still have another maybe three or four minutes. Any comment, observation? Well, we, um, <clears throat> maybe we could encourage IACD to have a, a I'd of course call it a kind of sharper focus on on this kind of theme and topic, uh, and you know widen it in in that way because uh, I think merit. The assumption I have is that, is that not not too many community development practitioners in Scotland or 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 in England, in fact, are are committed to this wider view of of challenging the economic structures, you know. And I think that would be quite an interesting kind of theme, you know, for you know for a year, picking up Saka's points and other points and op open it up quite quite a bit. Uh, as you know, in the UK, uh, expenditure on public policies have been reduced nearly every week. Every week, there's cuts in public expenditure at all levels. 
Uh, and that's a very, very serious issue. And I suppose my, my commitment is how does community development help the local authority do its job better rather than be competing with it in the narrow sense? So that's a bigger challenge, Daniel. <laughs> Okay, thank, thank you, Jim, and uh, thanks for the suggestion. I will uh, possibly bring it up with uh, in our discussions. <coughs> um, uh, there is a professional development committee is an issue that uh, possibly I can make a suggestion and then we see how, how, how we move it forward. Because again, it, it's another opportunity given that the declining public resources and also resources from some of the other sources for supporting community development and given the dynamics that have taken place i don't know when the world is going to stabilize and after the issues that are coming up and diversion of resources to support the challenge that has arisen from the war in the eastern europe and so that, that's yeah. something that i might want to to look at at length so that then we can have alternative sources of revenue to support community development and communities that are in need Thank you very much. So, Meredith has put up a notice that uh, we have the AGM coming up. We have the AGM coming up in the, I'm talking a different story, but uh, before <laughs> I go, <laughs> sorry, Meredith. Okay, let me finish with this one, which has come up. The, as part of our continuous, continuous engagement, the, ISED is hosting in partnership with the inclusive practices in the, based in Georgia, the World Community Development Conference 2022. It was to be in June, but because of the war in Europe, in uh, Ukraine, then this has been pushed to October, from October 3rd, the World Community Development Conference 2022. And the deadline for submission of abstracts has also been pushed to August 1st. So we have another opportunity now to make our submissions so that then again, we can have another forum. In better days, we would have met physically, but hopefully in the World Community Development Conference 2023 in Darwin, Australia, we can have an opportunity now to hug each other. Hopefully, we'll have now overcome many of these challenges. But for now, let's uh, register for World Community Development Conference 2022 being organized by Inclusive Practices Georgia. And the conference is virtual in uh, October 5th, I mean, 3rd to 5th. Abstracts open up to 1st of August 2022. The registration is affordable, US $50. That uh, should be fairly affordable to many of us. But of course, in the event, we have a colleague who cannot make it. Make your submission, then we can see how to support the process going forward. Thank you very much. And uh, I was talking about the AGM that is going to happen in the next three hours. Meredith was sharing in the chat the, the registration link on Eventbrite as part of the risk management. Uh, ISED's events are attended on registration, pre registration because that, that's a requirement uh, for, in terms of managing the risk. And so if you have not registered, you go to Eventbrite, you register, then you'll be able to get now the, the link to join the AGM in the next uh, three hours. Mm. Possibly, yeah, the next three hours. And I think uh, we are coming to the, to the hour. So next steps, we, are, we continue with our series of, uh, of webinars. And so the coming up is, uh, Social protection in August, social protection in community development being presented by Amidu from Nigeria. And then in September, we'll have a, a masterclass being presented by Janine Ward from South Africa. And I don't want to preempt, but uh, Amidu and uh, Janine, you'll meet them again during the AGM and they are prominent supporters of our webinar series in the region. And that means, of course, December, we have the open forum where now we meet as uh, members of ISED in the region. And of course, our, those who are able to join us in an open forum just to reflect what has happened and what is going to happen going forward. 
And that means then we have two slots in uh, October and November, where we are inviting us again to volunteer with a topic of interest, a topic of your own interest, and then we can schedule you. So you're welcome to volunteer. But meantime, every second uh, Wednesday of the month, we have our presentation. So July, second Wednesday, August, second Wednesday, September, second Wednesday, going forward. You're welcome to join us in our webinar series, ISED Sub-Saharan Africa region. So I think we come to the end of this uh, presentation and uh, it was a pleasure having you. Thank you very much. Let's see you later in the afternoon or in the evening or late morning, wherever your region for the AGM. Thank you very much.